How many of you guys have ever heard the saying, Jesus is the reason for the season? Now, come on, raise your hand. How many of you guys heard that saying? Jesus is the reason for the season, right? It's a great saying, right? It's used to remind us, it's used to remind the world, right, that it's not necessarily about Santa Claus or gifts or presents, but what we sang about, what we are gathered here to worship and celebrate this evening, right? Jesus' birthday party, Christ coming into the world, God with us, Emmanuel. However, I want to tell you this, mo- or this evening, see, it's weird preaching evening services. I want to tell you this evening that I disagree with that statement. Now, don't, don't throw any kind of vegetables. Let's not call me a heretic yet, okay? I want to disagree with that statement. I don't think that Jesus is the reason for the season. I believe you are the reason for the season. Now, listen, I say that. I'm glad I at least got one amen. It got really quiet in here. Someone is at least maybe following my train of thought. And when I say that, I say it, I almost cringe when I say it. Because it kind of reflects our cultural attitude, a, a kind of a me first mentality, right? It sounds conceited, it sounds self absorbed to say that you are the reason for the season or that I am the reason for the season. But I want to contend with you tonight that it's true, and the Bible says so. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. I want us to read it together tonight. Read it with me. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. The Apostle Paul here is speaking to the church at Corinth, and he's reminding them about how the Macedonians gave an overwhelmingly gracious gift for the survival of the Corinthian church. And they gave out of their, out, out of their weakness. They gave out of their Uh, out of their poorness. And then he goes into verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8 and he reminds them of the gift of Jesus Christ that came about in the very same way. Because you see, the gift of Christ is the most generous gift that you and I will ever be given. And even in Christ, we find the best gift giver that ever existed. I love how he began the verse. He says, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, did you know that the Christmas story, the the thing that we celebrate tonight, it is the graceful story. God is giving us a gift that we have not earned, that we could never repay, that we could have never brought on our own. It is truly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was unmerited. We did nothing to deserve it. Can can you believe God is giving us a gift? He's, He's giving us the gift of his son. He gave the people at the time the gift of his son to a people who were rebellious against him. People who turned their back against him. People who were sinful and slandered him and disobeyed him. And he still gave them the gift of his son. He still gives us the gift of his son. It is truly a grace. And then Paul paints the picture of what that grace looks like. He goes on and he says that though he was rich, yet he became poor. Though he was rich, he became poor. Now right there in that first verse, or in that first part, is the evidence of the pre-existence of Christ and the humility that is there, right? Scripture says, for unto us a son, or unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, (laughs) 
right? Christ existed long before he came into this world when he was born as a baby. It shows his humility. It reminds us that he was rich. It reminds us that he was reigning and ruling on high, that he was sitting at the right hand of God the Father, that he was equal in power and glory with the Father, that he was rich in all glory and majesty, and he exchanged it. He exchanged a throne for a manger. He exchanged a glorified body for a sack of skin. He exchanged heaven for earth. Later on, the Apostle Paul would tell the church at Philippi this. He'd say, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Paul reminds us that Christ's poverty, that though he was rich, he became poor, didn't start and end in a manger. He finishes that passage in Philippians by saying that when he humbled himself, he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. You see, folks, the poverty didn't start and end in a manger. It it was his entire life. It was the entire life of Christ from Bethlehem to Nazareth to the Garden of Gethsemane to Golgotha where the cross was. He was born in poverty. He lived in poverty. He died in poverty. He was born in a borrowed bed. He died and was buried in a borrowed tomb. Though he was rich, he became poor. Why? This leads me back to why I say it's not Jesus is the reason for the season, but you are the reason for the season. Look with me. It's my favorite part of the verse. It's in between the though he was rich, he became poor. It says, yet for your sakes. Yet for your sakes. He did all of that. For you. Christmas is for you. He came down here for you. Why? Because he saw your situation. He saw that man was sinful. He saw that man could not obtain righteousness on their own. They saw that man continued to go backwards and didn't make any progress forward. And he responded in love. You see, us in our humanness, we would get rid of us. <laughs> he responded rather in love and showed us his love by sending his son who sacrificed everything he had on heaven and on earth to die on a cross, to pay your sin debt, to rise from the grave, to secure your salvation. He did all that for you. He was willing to go through this life Poor, surrender everything, be whipped and beaten eventually and hung on a cross, bloodshed for you. It's the whole reason he came. For you, for your sake. Even though he knew that we would turn. Even though he knew we would continue to sit. Even though he knew we continue to deny. Even though we would continue to be revived. So that you, and here's the best part, he just didn't come and do it. Look, look. It says, so that you, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Might be rich. Now some of you are like, okay, I can listen now. Right? Might be rich. I ain't talking physically. Christ never gave us, came to make us rich in this world. He came to make us rich spiritually. He came so that you may be saved. So that you may have eternal life. Riches in that you may be a child of the king. Because you see, if you're not a child of the king, if you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Scripture says you're a child of the devil. That you were born into sin. That you could not obtain righteousness on your own. Hence why Christ came for you. And did all the things to obtain righteousness that you couldn't do. So that way you didn't have to do it. So that way you could just put your faith and trust in him. 
in order to obtain it. Riches in a child of God, riches in having favor with God, riches in having the promises of the new covenant, riches having the hope of eternal life, rich as being heirs of the kingdom, rich in being reborn and reconciled unto God, redeemed and remade. He did all of it for you. He became poor so that you might be rich. I hope by now I've made my point that you are the reason for the season. Yes, it came about because of Jesus. It's still a good saying. But ultimately, it's because of you. And if it's true, and it certainly is, listen to me, then it should be our greatest joy at Christmas. It should be our greatest joy that he loved us enough that he was willing to forsake all of that to come for you and for me. It should be our desire to give him our life, our soul, our all, to glorify him, to worship him, to please him. Because if he wouldn't have done that, we would still be lost, walking in darkness. So the question tonight is how will you respond to the fact that Christ did this for you. Will you respond? Because just because he made that decision to come and die on a cross and pay for your sins so that we could be reconciled, so that we could be saved, there's a big word in that last part of the verse. It says that ye through his poverty might be rich. Might be rich. Look, you may be the reason of the season, but salvation's dependent upon you. He has shown his grace. He took the first step for you to be reconciled. That's what we celebrate tonight. But the richness of having a relationship with him, the richness of salvation, the richness of the promises of God, the richness of the joy that we have in him, of the hope that we have in him, of the love that we have in him, of the peace that we have in him, the eternal life that we gain through him, all depends on what you do with Jesus. Will you put your faith and trust in him? Or will you cast him away? And to do nothing with him is the same as casting him away. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me this evening?